up, my fuckies? It's the hater. It's Monday night. So you know what that means. But before we get to what that actually means, let me just say one thing. At first, I was going to try to do a live stream up in this bitch, you know? I made the little picture that I'm going to use for this video. I went on YouTube and I tried to do a live stream. But unfortunately, apparently, I need streaming software, you know? And I was going to go download some, but then I figured... What's the point of that? I'll just do the video today, and then maybe another time, I'll download the software and uh, get at it uh, with a live stream up in this bitch. How do other people do it? You know, those people that go on a live stream and then, like, people have a chat on, on YouTube? How does that happen? I don't understand. It is what it is. The hater is not, is not I mean, I'm pretty technologically savvy, but, you know, I'm, I'm like a, an intermediate. I'm an intermediate. All right. So, since our last video, which was yesterday, motherfucker. <laughs> uh, we've gotten two new subscribers, but neither of them showed up in the notifications. So before I start, I just want to say shout out to all the people involved in that comment war in my last video. Um, I'll put a link to the last video <laughs> if you guys if you guys want to go check out the comment war in there. It was like 300 comments of comment war. Now I gotta say one thing about that, and that's this: I appreciate everyone's opinions because you know while we are a united group, there are some subdivisions in our in our uh, in our fight, if you will, right? Some people like NXT, some people don't like NXT. It's like that episode of South Park when Cartman goes to Juvenile Hall and the guy comes at him and he says, "As far as I'm concerned, kid, there's two kinds of people: those who like Animaniacs and those who don't like Animaniacs." And he looks at Cartman and he says. Which one are you? And Cartman says, I don't like Animaniacs. And the guy's like, good. <laughs> Neither do we, motherfucker. So uh, there you have it. But I do appreciate the fact that people were talking. You know, we're engaging each other, you know. Uh, I mean, part of me hopes that it was just more people talking about love, you know. But through the comments, I knew immediately that it was going to be some sort of uh, angry ramblings. But I thought everyone held themselves uh, quite well. I responded to the people that I saw. I, I read, I think, most of the comments, all 300 of them, um, and yeah, so also, last video, I told you guys about my email, sucks at gmail.com, I've already gotten some emails, uh, thank you to all of you that have emailed me, I'm not sure if people want me to talk about, like, if they emailed me or not, you know, some people that, like, their names were different than their screen names, and they, some of them differentiated, some of them didn't, but I'm not going to talk about it unless you want me to, you know, but I thank all of you, and uh, I will keep your questions and things like that anonymous for another time, uh, for a Q&A maybe, when I hit, let's say, 500 subscribers, we're almost at 400, motherfucks, so if you're here and you have not subscribed, subscribe right now, motherfucks, get me to that 400, so then you can give me that 500, and give me to that 1,000, and then at that point, I'm going to start taking people out, motherfucks, I'm going after other YouTubers that I don't like, you understand me, we're still building the army first but we'll we'll get there um yeah so thanks for all that guys i'm gonna leave my email in the description the link to the comment section for the other video and i might leave a link or two to some other video of mine that i think is worth watching so uh with that being said let's get to tonight's monday night raw off the top of my head there's one segment that i actually liked and other ones i don't really remember if i like them or not so we'll have to read these notes that i took up in this bitch <laughs> all right so the show started out orton came out right same shit as the last two weeks, except this time, there is no Matt Hardy. Maybe he's on his way over to AEW, where he could be a main eventer after being cucked by Randy Orton. That remains to be seen. So, uh, he says the same exact things, but now instead of Matt Hardy, Kevin Owens comes out. At first, I'm like, what the fuck? Then I realize they're in Winnipeg, so I'm like, oh, they go Canada, you know? Maybe, like, uh, Orton just attacks Owens, and Edge comes in, because he's in Canada, gets a huge pop, and, uh, there you have it. You know, that would be a good little moment, but... I was like, mm, if that were to happen, that would happen at the end of the show. Plus, certain other things happened in the show that made me realize that that's just not going to happen. You know what I mean? So, um, but we'll get to that later. So basically, he says the same shit. Kevin Owens comes out and asks for clarification as to why he did it. Like, he, I don't understand this idea that, like, people that just watch Randy Orton destroy Edge. Like, where the fuck were Matt Hardy and Kevin Owens while he was doing this, you know? Like, why didn't they come and save Edge? Because Kevin Owens gave this speech about how Edge is his hero. Then, like, he grew up, like, dreaming of facing Edge one day. And now he might not get that chance because of what Orton did. And I'm like, dude, if you felt so strongly, why don't you come and save Edge? You know? That doesn't make any sense. Why, why would you just stand there while Edge nearly dies, right? And then come out and then ask Orton why he did it. Who cares why he did it? The point is he did. You know what I'm saying? And it's not your business, fat boy. But anyways, that happened. And uh, instead of, like, Orton attacking him, they just... Decided to have a match later on tonight. This was so forgettable that by the, the end of, of Raw, like 
at 10.30ish, me and my friend were talking and he was like, what's the main event? And I'm like, I don't know. And then I, eventually I'm like, oh, that's right. Owens, Randy Orton, no one cares, right? Then we had Angel Garza versus Carrillo. My friend that I was watching with, he said, man, this Angel Garza guy reminds me of Eddie Guerrero. And I hate to say, motherfucks, but I see it a little bit. Now, <laughs> I'm not prepared to say that Angel Garza is the next Eddie Guerrero. That's a foolish thing that an AEW fan would do. But I will say that out of the four people that will be in a tag team match uh, next week, except for, of course, Rey Mysterio, who's already like an established legend, uh, Angel Garza is better than uh, Umberto Carrillo, who's the worst one. And I think he might be better than Andrade. You know, I like, I like Angel Garza. Like, the, the few minutes that he's had on TV have impressed me. You know what I mean? Like, he had that promo where he was, like, uh, talking shit to Umberto a few, a few weeks ago. And then Umberto starts talking back to him in Spanish. And, and Angel Garza's like, what? In English, he's like, what? <laughs> like, I don't understand you. Speak English, motherfuck. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. He's got this, like, smirk, this cocky smirk that fits. You know, it just fits. Like, he he is, like, decent in the ring. I mean, like, I'm not going to say he's better or worse than Angel and then Humberto Carrillo, but he's decent in the ring. You know, he's got some charisma. He's got some natural, like, like, haha, this guy's cool, you know? Like, like I sense that in him. Now, again, in order to become Andy Guerrero, he will need to, like, increase his charisma, like, a thousandfold and gain about 30 pounds of muscle. But maybe he can. I mean, I think he's a young guy. Who the fuck knows, right? We'll see. But I like him. Um, it's him. Versus uh, Umberto Carrillo in, I mean, it, I would say this, it's this week's ma uh, rat's ass of the, of the week match, whatever, who gives a rat's ass of the week match, but I'm not sure that it is. But um, it was a shit match. I didn't like it at all. He, first of all, it went on too long. It went on like three commercial breaks, you know? And in the beginning of the match, there was this spot. It was just, it was straight up gay. I, I, there's no other word to say other than gay, right? They, they do like a handstand and they're like hooking legs in this weird, like, like think of a 69, except both people are facing each other. You know, but they're doing a handstand. And while they're in this handstand, I don't even know how they got to it. They start slapping each other. Then it ends with one of them on top of the other in a straight up missionary position. It really was gay. And it was incestuous because these guys are cousins, motherfucker. I did not like that. The match ended when um, Humberto Carrillo was distracted by Zelina Vega and uh, Angel Garza did like a roll up and won, right? Now, Here's the thing, motherfucks, and this is an important element that I should talk about in another video, but I'm going to talk about it here because it's relevant right now, right? If you're going to have, like, all right, here, here's how wrestling works, all right? He, Tony Khan, <laughs> Cucky Rhodes, here's how wrestling works. You, there's two options. You have a long match that means something, or you have a short match that means nothing, right? You cannot have a long match, right, that means nothing, and you cannot have a short match that means something. It's as simple as that. This is all you need to know about wrestling, right? So th think of it this way, right? If you have Undertaker versus Shawn Michaels, and if Undertaker wins, Michaels' career is over, this cannot be a short match, right? Because you cannot end a man's career, especially someone like Shawn Michaels, you can't end his career in like a three-minute squash match, right? Because it has to mean something, right? Then on the other side of the coin, right? The Rock versus Big Boss Man at King of the Ring, right? The idea being that the, the storyline is The Rock's gonna get is gonna get screwed by the end of the night, right? And Rock beats Boss Man with a roll up, right? A short match means nothing, right? Big Boss Man was already like eliminated by DQ or some shit, right? It was this was just another way to give The Rock an easy win. You understand what I'm saying? But when you have a long match that means nothing, why would I be interested in that, right? Now I'm barely interested in a short match that means nothing. Right? But why would I be interested in a long match that means nothing? So I asked my, my friend at, during the first commercial break, I'm like, what's the point of this match? Like, does it matter if the guy with blue tights or the guy with red tights wins? That's literally what it was. It's these two cousins, one has blue tights, one has red tights, who gives a shit who wins? Like, th does anyone benefit, right, from winning or losing this match? You know? No, the answer is no, motherfucks, because next week there will be a tag match where Humberto Carrillo will be on one side and Garza will be on the other side. So it wouldn't matter at all who won. And it's not going to matter who wins that match either, right? Who cares? You know? So it, it, what I'm saying is, if you're going to have a match that doesn't matter, make it seven minutes. Make it seven minutes. You don't need to, you don't need to give me a 30-minute match. That's not entertaining, motherfucks, right? And AW has this problem, you know? They have matches that mean fucking nothing, right? It means zero. And it's like a 20-minute match. Like Ambrose versus fucking Darby Allen. Like, who cares? Does it really matter? No, it doesn't matter at all. You know, and then matches that, that are meaningful, a lot of times they decide to make them shorter in order to have these like 
clinical matches, technical masterpieces. Like I give a rat's ass. You take two luchadors, take their masks off, and now they're Humberto Carrillo and Angel Garza, and they're allowed to have a 30-minute match? What? Why do you even need these guys? I mean, I like Angel Garza, but just take Lince Dorado and fucking Kalisto and make them these guys. You don't need to hire two new ones. What's the point, you know? Doesn't matter. Like, there's are just two luchadors. There's nothing really there, especially with Humberto Carrillo. This guy's just garbage. He's the worst. So... I didn't enjoy this match, but I do like Angel Garza. And at one point, Angel Garza did his little pant uh, spot where he rips off his pants. And my friend was like, that's stupid. And I'm like, I agree. It's not like the best thing that someone ever does. But if you compare him and Humberto Carrillo, who are the exact same guy, at least he's smart enough to understand that, yo, if I rip my pants off, that gives me one thing above Humberto Carrillo, right? And his finisher is better. And, you know, he's just better. So there you go. Next, we had uh, Kakoshe uh, versus the OC, quote-unquote. The OC comes out, and I'm like, it's going to be Gallows, obviously, right? Because they're not going to let Ricochet beat AJ, right? And they're not going to let Ricochet lose until next week, motherfucks. So, uh, or I guess until this week when Brock Lesnar destroys him. So, how crazy would it be if, like, Ricochet wins? <laughs> Can you imagine that? He just, like, beats Brothers are clean, <laughs> and it's Ricochet versus Drew McIntyre. I know the chances are zero, but what if, like, that would be, like, the greatest sword of all time? Anyways, so, um, you know, a typical Ricochet match. He hits the recoil, then hits a shooting star press. Uh, I was telling my friend that every time Ricochet climbs a turnbuckle, you think this guy just died, right? doesn't matter. He's the one who hits, like, his one of his finishers, I guess, the, the, the recoil. And then he's, for some reason, he's hurt. And he can barely climb up the turnbuckle, right? I know it's to sell, like, the, the anticipation of the move. But it's, like, it's so overplayed. Like, everyone does that, you know? So he hits the shooting star press. And, like, every other high-flying wrestler, you know, if you hit your high-flying move, you win. If you miss it, you will lose the match next move, right? He hits it, so he wins, right? Who gives the rat's ass, right? Then Brock Lesnar comes out. All the fans are on their feet, right? And I'm telling my friend... This is because he's a star. The end. It's as simple as that. You know, Humberto Carrillo and Angel Garza wrestle. No one cares. Everyone's sitting down, not giving a shit, probably taking a piss break. But then Brock Lesnar comes out and everyone's on their feet. This is the difference, motherfucks. You know, this is the difference. Why don't they push Christopher Daniels in AW? I think he's a better wrestler. He's a, he's a better in-ring technician than Brock Lesnar. And the, the, the simple answer for all you simple people is that if Christopher Daniels is out in the ring doing nothing, like hopping around... No one cares. They just go and take a shit in the bathroom to and avoid the entire the entire segment, right? When Brock Lesnar's there, everyone stands up. <laughs> what is it? I don't know. Some people call it silent charisma. Some people just call it being awesome. Call it what you want, motherfuckers. But Brock Lesnar is a star. Um, Paul Heyman cuts a, cuts a typical Paul Heyman promo. The entire point of this was just like, look at Brock Lesnar. You know, that's how good Brock Lesnar is. Just look at him. Here, give me your money, you know? Here, buy his shirt too, cucks. So then... Um, we have Aleister Black versus Rowan. Before this, uh, I didn't write it down in my notes, but I remember just now. Before this, Aleister Black had a little confrontation with the OC who attacked him backstage. Now, they didn't, like, destroy him. They attacked him a little bit, but he was selling the injuries like he got killed. You know? So he comes out and Tim versus Rowan. So I'm thinking, all right, you know, this is going to be like Rowan's going to win, but it's a tainted win because Aleister Black was attacked. No, that's not what happened. But I will say this is the segment. Weirdly enough... This is a segment that I actually enjoyed, and I will explain why I enjoyed it uh, specifically to this match and in the greater context of professional wrestling, like I always do for you motherfucks, right? So think about it this way, right? The match starts, there's already a story on board, right? I'm not talking about the fact that th this match happened last week. Let's ignore that completely. The story is this. Aleister Black has to fight a big motherfuck, right? And Aleister Black just got attacked. So Aleister Black is not 100%. So... Now, even though Aleister Black is the guy that would normally win this match, as evidenced by the fact that he won last week, uh, now you might think to yourself, oh, maybe Eric Rowan's going to win because he's big and he's going to capitalize on the fact that Aleister Black is injured. Now, the match started. That's kind of what happened. Aleister Black was fighting like half acidly. You know, Rowan hit some big moves. He hit like a, almost like a side effect, right? Like, like a rock bottom where he, but he falls on the side instead of forward. Uh, and he's a big guy, so it looked pretty good, right? He went for the Iron Claw. Alistair Black escaped. Long story short, they end up outside. Alistair Black is near the, the steps, and um, Rowan just goes for a, what's it called? Like a cross body, right? He goes for the cross body, and Alistair Black moves out of the way. Rowan hits the steps. Pretty normal spot, nothing special here, except for the fact, motherfucks, that his little pen or the cage um, where the little mystery animal thing is was on top 
of uh, of the steps, right? So it knocks it knocks the pen over. So I'm like, oh, great. I'm like, what's going to happen now, in my estimation, is Rowan's going to lose it and just destroy Alistair Black, which is exactly what happened. He attacked Alistair Black, whooped his ass, and power bombed him from the outside to the post. Then he threw him in the ring. And this is where, like, the way I would have done it is he just runs in the ring, does the iron claw three times, and pins uh, Alistair Black to push forward the idea that you don't fuck with whatever's in the cage, which is kind of what they've been doing for two months, you know? But whatever. In, in this instance, he didn't lose his mind like he did with the jobbers, right? It, which is weird. It's inconsistent if you think about it. But he goes to check on the pen. The, the ref is counting up to nine. He goes in the ring, gets the, the black mass on him twice. Alistair Black wins, right? Now, the reason why I like this is because... There was a story that was told in this match. There were, in fact, there were two stories. Story one, Alistair Black is injured, so he should not win this match. Story two, Alistair Black angered Rowan by inadvertently fucking with the, the cage thing, right? Story three, I mean, these are all part of the same story, but you understand. Element three, I should say. Element three of the story, Rowan is distraught at what happened to his caged friend. So this distracts him momentarily, allowing the injured Alistair Black to deliver two finishers to beat Rowan, right? This was a good match. It was a well-booked match because there was a, an, a, a story here, right? And the match played out as part of that story. Like, the, what I'm saying is what happened in the match had clear links to elements of the story that we saw. So that's great, right? It, when we see Randy Orton versus Edge at Mania, you would expect Edge to hit a concerto. Right? Maybe Christian comes in, they hit a control. I don't know. But you, like, maybe, like, Randy Orton attacks Ed, Christian next week or something. He's going to attack Beth Phoenix next week, but we'll get to that. So, you would expect that to come into play, right? You would expect an element of that to come into play, right? So, that's, that's what storytelling is. It's not Cody Rhodes crying while, as he's getting whipped. That's not storytelling. That's just a segment, right? Storytelling, motherfuckers, is when the, the match takes into account the things that have happened to set up the match. Perfect example. A while ago, back in the day, the greatest tag team of all time, the Dudley Bro the Boys, Dudley Boys, the Dudley Boys, had a feud. This was when the Dudley Boys were heels, but for this feud, they were faces, right? I don't remember if they stayed faces or turned heel again, but for this feud, they were faces. The feud was this. Bubba Ray Dudley had a crush on Trish Stratus, right? The retard of the Dudley brothers had a, tr a crush on on Trish Stratus. It was kind of like what's happened with Otis and Mandy, except more like serious, I guess, right? So what happened was Trish Stratus would tease him. And on top of having a crush on Trish, Bubba Ray also had a fetish for tables. So there was a thing where Trish Stratus was wearing lingerie and she was on top of a table and like being sexy and stuff. And she's like, come on, Bubba, right? And he was like enamored by her. And Devon was like, you idiot. Like she's using you, Bubba, right? You got to see through this, right? And Bubba Ray was like, no, no, I like her, more or less, right? And then during a match, Albert just does the, the A-bomb, or whatever the fuck it was called, the, 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 the Baldo bomb back then, the Baldo bomb through a table, right? Because Bubba Ray is distracted because Trish kissed him, right? And the storyline was Bubba Ray refuses to do what Bubba Ray does, which is put women through tables, right? Because he likes Trish. And on top of that, the fact that he likes Trish is getting in the way of the Dudley boys winning matches. So what happened was they had a pay-per-view match, right? At this point, Bubba Ray was already betrayed. So he was like, I'm going to get you, you little bitch, right? Devon's wrestling for most of the match. Devon tags in Bubba Ray, right? Same thing happens. At a certain point, uh, Bubba Ray gets distracted by Trish and misses the 3D, which allows, I think, Test to... I don't even know how I remember this shit, but Test does a big boot a running big boot to Devon, and, like, I think they pinned Devon or something, right? And now, uh, they try to do a post-match beatdown, but the Dudley boys win. They hit the 3D, they destroy, uh, what's it called? Uh, TNA, right? Then Bubba grabs Trish, who gives him a kiss, right? And he lets her go. And Trish is like, hey, I got away with it again. But he grabs her again, throws her to Devon. Devon puts her on, on Bubba, who super bombs Trish through a table. The fans go nuts, Right? That's what storytelling is. Storytelling is there's a match and a post-match segment, right? The match, the, the point of the match wasn't who wins the match. It was a meaningful match for other reasons. The fact that Dudley's loss is irrelevant. What matters is Bubba Ray and, to a lesser degree, Devon got their comeuppance. Bubba Ray powerbombed the girl that used him through a table, right? And that 
speaks to a lot of things. People are like, oh, this girl used me. I can't do anything about it. Well, you can if you're Bubba Ray. So that's, wh that's what storytelling is. It's not this kind of bullshit of like, oh, Cody, Cody had a match with Ty Dillinger. The storytelling was excellent. Was it? What was so great about it? That he came out with his dog and mentioned his father 17 times? Get the fuck out of here. So that's why I liked Alistair Black versus Rowan. Next up, we had the worst segment of the night by far, the women's contract signing. Um, you have like four women already in the ring. Right? The jobbers. You have Ruby Riot, uh, fucking Liv Morgan, uh, Sarah Logan, what are the fuckers? Liv Morgan, Sarah Logan, and Ruby Riot, and uh, and Asuka. They're already in there because, like, they have no chance of winning, right? Which I thought was bad because it's like you have to put these people over as if they have a chance. Now, I understand that the Women's Elimination Chamber will be there to push forward the idea that Ruby Riot and Liv Morgan have a feud and that Natalia and Asuka are going to have a feud. Sarah Logan is just there to fill a spot, and obviously, um, Shayna Baszler is going to win, right? Because it appears that what's going to happen, in, in, based on that leaked card and also common sense, is it's going to be Kabuki Warriors versus uh, Natty and Beth, right, for the women's tag titles, which should be entertaining because Beth Phoenix is cool. And I hope Natty does that move she used to do the pin-up strong. Remember the pin-up strong cuts? But anyways, so uh, Natty comes out to music, and then Shayna Baszler is not there. She doesn't give a fuck. So they're talking shit, right? They all sign it. Uh, the feuds that are supposed to like be highlighted are highlighted. Um, then Shayna comes out, signs it. A brawl starts, right? The brawl ends with just Shayna in the ring. Becky Lynch comes out, dressed like the broad from Kill Bill, right? And she's got those uh, emoji glasses on again. Now, this, I mean, just when you think it can't get worse, you know, like when she put the glasses on the first time, that was like cringe level 1,000. But now, it's over 9,000, motherfucks. It's over 9,000 because she did it again. You know, she didn't learn from people like the hater who said, this is not cool. This is gay, motherfuckers. Right? So, um, that's how we had it there. You know, that's, that's how that was. It was very bad, in my opinion. So, there you go, you know. Um, what else? Yeah, Becky came out and brawled with Shayna. I don't really know how the brawl ended. I don't care. I just tuned out in my head. But after that, we had like a like a two for one. What the fuck is it? Two for one. Angelo Dawkins versus Murphy and Seth versus Montez. So the first match, Dawkins versus Murphy, right? The match lasts about 45 seconds to a minute and a half, right? Uh, Murphy does his little combo with kicks, goes for a bunch of knees. Uh, my friend points out, he's like, man, Murphy looks really small. And I'm like, yeah, because he's not there next to Tazawa. Now he's there next to Angelo Dawkins, who's much bigger than him. And it shows how small Murphy is. Basically, long story short, Murphy goes off the ropes. Uh, Angelo Dawkins hits the sky high on him. Goes for the pin. Rollins comes in and kicks uh, Dawkins and causes the DQ. Dawkins wins by DQ. Now, here's the problem with this, motherfucks. My friend actually pointed this out. He was like, I don't like how they, they just booked Murphy. And I'm like, why not? He's a jobber. My friend's like, Murphy beat Daniel Bryan clean. Murphy took Roman Reigns to the limit. And now he gets pretty much squashed. By Angelo Dawkins? And I'm like, yeah, good point. It proves that these people are all a bunch of mid-card jobbers. But anyways, after that, we have Rollins versus Montez. Uh, like every other, like I said earlier, like every other high-flying high -flying wrestler, Montez eventually goes for this, his five-star frog splash, misses, and immediately after that, Rollins hits the stomp and pins him. The match was all right, actually. Like, I, I, I mean, not all right. Like, I didn't really enjoy it because but it, it made Rollins feel like the mid-carder he is. Maybe the under-carder that he is. But... I will say, like, uh, I was relatively impressed by Montez Ford. Like, he's about the same size as Rollins. That was a little weird. I thought he was much skinnier, but... And he is, sk he is skinnier, but not much skinnier. So that was all right. Next, we have the main event. Cox! <laughs> Randy Orton versus uh, Kevin Owens. The Monday Night Ass, uh, which is, of course, uh, Seth Rollins. Monday Night Asaya, motherfucks. <laughs> what the fuck was that, by the way? I was talking to my friend earlier. I'm like, did you hear that Buddy Murphy called Rollins last week the Monday Night Asaya? And my friend, who was a big fan of Seth Rollins, he was like, oh, it's just because, you know, Buddy Murphy is from Australia. Like, he's got an accent. And I'm like, no, 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 fam. His name is Murphy. He knows the letter M. You know, he just called him my night Asaya because he's a retard. Because he's not good at his job, right? And so, uh, from now on, I'm just going to call Seth Rollins the Monday Night Ass. So, during the match between Orton and, uh, and uh, Owens, right, the Monday Night Ass and his entourage come out um, to equalize them. The Street Profits and the Viking Raiders come out and take them all out. Somehow Seth Rollins escapes all this 
and comes back, right? Seth Rollins comes back, tries to interfere. Kevin Owens thwarts his interference several times. Then Rollins grabs his foot uh, while he's on the apron. Randy Orton grabs, uh, what's it called? Owens, and does the vintage Orton, the draping DDT motherfuckers, and he pins him. At this point, the ref counts really, really fast. So I'm thinking to myself, what the fuck just happened? My friend's like, I think they screwed up. I'm just like, well, why would they, why would they screw up? Like, like, what's the point? You're, you're trying to save three seconds? Just count normally, right? And I'm like, oh, maybe like they lost their cue. And since there, since there was like five minutes left, maybe something needs to happen, right? So the ref ended the match early. No, that's not what happened, cucks. Uh, after that, um, what's it called? Yeah, Orton, uh, like Owens is still down. Seth Rollins gets two chairs, throws him in the ring to Orton so Orton can do the, what's it called? The concerto to Owens. Man, he sets it up, but then Owens gets up and picks up the chair. And Orton says, I'm sorry. And he just like drops the chair and leaves. Then, uh, the referee, that's what happened. The referee steals the chair from Owens. So at this point, I'm like, oh, all right, good. The referee's part of the storyline, right? And as Owens goes and grabs the referee outside, Rollins runs away. Owens throws the ref in the ring. And when he grabs the ref by the shirt, he kind of pulls it down a little bit. So I see that the shirt, that the ref is wearing a normal shirt. So I tell my friend, I'm like, all right, the ref is obviously like a cult follower. He's a disciple of the Monday night ass, right? And my friend's like, what? And then he rips the referee's shirt off to reveal the shirt, which I saw kind of secretly. My friend's like, wow, you called him. And I'm like, yeah, dog, you know what I'm saying? So he reveals that the ref is now like a disciple, I guess, of, of Seth Rollins, right? Which brings up the point that another friend of mine made, which is that unfortunately it does appear that the Monday night ass is somewhat based, let's be real, on the dark order. I hate to say it. But now he's like a he's like a cult leader all of a sudden. I don't know why he's never been presented as a cult leader, but I guess he is now. So it is what it is. So the ref apparently has joined the Monday night ass and his friends, and the ref gets a stunner for all his troubles. Owens goes and gets a table, sets it up, and does a power bomb on the ref, to the ref on the table. Now, all right, this wasn't a horrible horrible segment. The match wasn't what wasn't good, but. The right, like, the things that needed to happen, happened, right? Orton got the win, which makes him look strong. And, I mean, it wasn't clean, but he didn't cheat. Like, it wasn't him who cheated, right? Like, the ref cheated on his behalf, unbeknownst to him. So, Orton won the match. Uh, Owens got retribution. And there was a little bit of character development for the Monday Night Ass in the sense that now it is legitimately a cult. Even though it's, it hasn't been presented as such now, um, it's... That's kind of what it is now, you know. It'd be good if everyone acted cultish, you know, but whatever. It's too late for that now, cucks. There you have it. That's another Monday Night Raw under the belt of the hater. Um, show was all right. I ain't going to say it was great, but it wasn't horrible. Now, the next videos that I'm going to do, motherfuckers. First of all, uh, it's a special week because this week we have, what's it called? Fucking uh, Super Showdown where we'll, we will see the coronation of the winner of the very prestigious to wake gauntlet match. So we have a lot to, to cover this week. We have that. I feel like there's something else. I mean, that might be UFC or something. I don't know. Probably not going to watch that. And I'm going to go to New York for the weekend, I think. I don't know. We'll see. So, um, yeah, there you have it. Uh, in terms of wrestling, it's that. John Cena's coming back on Friday. So I'm going to try. I don't think I'll be able to watch it because I'll be in New York. But if I can, I will, and I'll probably review it. I'm going to start watching SmackDown because someone in the comment section said SmackDown is, is off the chain now, and they're doing better. My friend confirmed it, too. He was like, yeah, SmackDown's getting better better uh, viewership. So I'm like, all right, cool. I'll check out SmackDown, motherfuckers. And I'm also going to do another video. I might tape it right now and release it sometime tomorrow. Uh, but I don't know because since I don't have an actual like release schedule in my head, I would tell you guys when it's going to be released just to hype up the anticipation. But uh, the video is going to be... It's going to be a 25 reasons, motherfuckers. It's going to be a 20. It's going to be a good one. Let me tell you. All right, motherfuckers. Uh, stay dirty and uh, keep it clean in the comment sections. Or actually, you know what? Do whatever the fuck you want. I enjoyed it a lot. I like fan engagement. I like engagement from you motherfuckers. All right, bitches. I'll see you guys later, cucks. <laughs>